Welcome to the Alapra Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. Welcome to the Elaborate Podcast. Mary, how are you? Very good. News on the honor, on the hour, followed by sport and weather. Where have we been today? We've been to the bunker in Parque de Capricho. Exactly. We've been to the Capricho before. Of all the parks in Madrid, because the last podcast of season five, we were in a park, Campo de las Naciones, where we're going to go and do another podcast and also go canoeing. If you watch our video we've made today, you'll realize why Mary's so reluctant to say anything <laughs> for that segment. Uh, how would you evaluate Capriccio? What's its vibe? I think it's kind of a weird place, to be honest, because it looks very sort of Versailles-esque, if you can say that. You know, there are a lot of like statues, like classical statues, and it's all very like regal. And then you have the bunker. The bunker, in, indeed, which will be the subject of part two, is Civil War era bunker, and uh, we'll be talking in more detail about that. But w- why is the bunker located in this off the beaten track park with Roman esque statues? Well, what they explained was that it was a good uh, strategic location, and also there were some empty facilities here that uh, made it easier to um, organize, like the. Uh, Madrid defense. Yeah, because if you think about parks in the Civil War, Casa de Campo is a very well-known uh, flashpoint. Like Franco troops came through there. Even if you go back farther in Spanish history, look at the Retiro. Uh, the French troops were stationed there when they occupied Spain. So these are parks that kind of live in the memory uh, when it comes to to wars and, and Spanish history. Capricho was was there a lot of fighting in this park as well. Yes, there was a lot of fighting. I think the the key thing about these parks is that back then, in that period, they were located in the outskirts of the city. So, I mean, it only makes sense, like strategically, that they were used as as uh, as bases because they're they're located in like different ends of uh, the limits of the city back then. Okay, um, now. Before we go into more detail about this in the next part, uh, I went to your Museum of Archaeology. <laughs> My museum. <laughs> the Mary Archaeology Museum. You've never been in the shop? Uh, no, I haven't. Not in the new one. Well, there wasn't an old one. Oh, yeah. Well, I discovered a book there mm-hmm. about... Uh, it's like the heart in the fire or the mind in the fire about the state of human society when cave drawings were being formed. So what was our mental landscape like? Very interesting. I think you agree with me, no? Yeah, it, it sounds fascinating. I must have a look when I'm there next. Um, and also archaeology, it, the breadth of history is, is pretty good, pretty staggering. Uh, obviously Egyptian stuff, because you are the Egyptian uh, extraordinaire. The best, Wing. the best tour guide of uh, of oh, that well. of that of that museum. Of course, um, because you don't spend forty five minutes in the first room. <laughs> no, don't want to name any names, so we move on. <laughs> um, there's also a virtual reality uh, suite yeah. uh, in two points. Well, there's several points you can put on goggles, uh, Samsung Galaxy goggles, and then kind of like mm. either go through a cave in caveman times. Or uh, walk through a medieval town, and there's also other locations as well. Did you know about these? I knew about it because when I'm walking uh, up the stairs to go to the Egyptian rooms, I always see it's always very busy. Yeah, it's very popular with kids and teenagers. Uh, and me. And you. And actually, no. The old adult. No, when I was there, um, a lot of actually it was mostly adults using it. I am. I have to say, but. I'm curious, so how do you actually get into the museum? Because you have special privileges. You're actually technically working there. So do you flash a badge? Um, not really. Um, well, we do have like a certain accreditation just to make it easy, uh, easier. But um, 
but during the weekends it's actually free entry so from yeah from like two o'clock yeah that's why there yeah that's why i was there <laughs> negative point um but yes i mean you just like you just have to like get tickets for people and that's it you just walk in i mean i i sort of like work for uh, a company that organizes like these tours yeah. Or this museum and other places. Technically, it seems that it's open to abuse that anybody could walk in off the street when it's free and say, I'm a tour guide. <laughs> Give me 10 tickets. No, I mean, well, I don't know. Why would you want to, to do that out of your own accord, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. Like some tours are, usually there aren't tours where people just turn up and you say all right like there's 10 people let's go in you know and the, yeah. all the tours that operate are either uh, part of the museum yeah. they're always pre-booked they're either like of course part of the museum or they are external companies that ask for permission and obviously one once you uh, get permission to do it with certain restrictions of of people of time and so on then you can just go ahead okay very nice well we shall march onward towards part two. Thank you very much for that insight into the world, the inner workings of man. <laughs> of man. <laughs> a man. The uh, Museum Archaeological National. Yeah. Or something to that effect. Museo Arqueológico Nacional. Thank you so much. <laughs> to the show so what we're going to do is we're going to bring you on an oral tour of the bunker so what I'm going to do to facilitate this is I'm going to be like I'm going to tell you what part of the bunker you are in and you're going to regurgitate what the tour guide told us for the listeners how about that sounds good to me okay so I said the scene is the Bami uh, summer's day August uh, 20 something uh, what 26th 2018. Oh, no, 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 no. The date. Oh, I don't <laughs> I know we've gone back to the past, you know, a little bit, but... Um, yeah, 26, 26. Okay, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're, like, some person listens to this in a year, it doesn't matter what day it was anyway, does it? No, it doesn't. Okay, so uh, we came in high spirits. We were giggling like schoolgirls. Uh, we got our lanyards with the tour guide stuff around our necks. Uh, the tour guide was talking about beach shows. Uh, like her insects, bats down there and everything. The temperature would drop by 15 degrees and everything as well. Yeah, but then I didn't think it was that cold. It wasn't and there that, wasn't any beaches. Uh, there wasn't any beaches, only like uh, was quite a butterfly. Yeah, just like a giant. You came up with a great... Uh, just, just like beach oak, by the way, as I said already, is a, like a Spanish insect. No, it's like a fly or whatever. Bug, Bug yeah. yeah. You came up with a great pun. Really tickled me. No! <laughs> it wasn't me, it was you. Yeah, okay. Son of a bitch, yo. People only be funny like <laughs> yeah. to, you know, bilingual speakers. Nobody else. And it was funny in the moment because we were there. Anyway, uh, more on that later possibly if you time we talk about a play that uh, kind of corresponds with those themes and also kind of other topics. But yeah, so you were in high spirits because every time you said that, you turned to me and went, oh, bitch, yo. Temperature drops by 15 degrees. You were very excited. And I really shared your excitement as well. It was, it was, it was nice to see that animal in your eyes and that just... <laughs> you're making it sound like I'm always depressed and miserable. No, no, no. You're always pretty happy. But you're like super happy today because uh, of all the beaches uh, <laughs> and all the the tour guide uh, uh, explained uh, stuff. So yeah, so we, we go down. Uh, so the first thing to say is that you enter, of course, and then you turn and go down several flights of stairs. Now, this is also a crucial part of the design, this little turn to the left. Yeah. Uh, can you take it from there, Mary? 
Well, it's just to make it more difficult to um, for the doors to explode, for the inner doors, because as he explained, you know, if they were to blow up the, the bunker, then um, the impact, if it was like a straight line, then the impact would just go through all the doors. But by doing that, they sort of deflect the, the impact of the explosion. Okay, so that, yeah, that was very interesting. Then you go down there, of course, and there's one room on our left, and we have taken photographs as well of these different rooms, uh, lots of water, very wet floors. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose of this room? The purpose of the first room uh, was to decontaminate whoever came in uh, that, you know, could have been subject to, um, well, he explained about like, uh, sort of like gas warfare that was like quite limited, but there were other, you know, derivatives of like uh, bombs and explosives that um, needed the, the contaminating so like people would just go in there and they would just be stripped of the clothes and they had to have a like a proper bath and wash their the hair to try and get rid of the because basically by doing that they just kind of like reduce the um, the risk of all the people getting also contaminated by whatever substance it was uh, also he mentioned that it was located under a natural water source no um, I think he mentioned something like this no um well i think uh well because like nowadays it sort of like has like two pumps to to make sure that the water doesn't go up but yeah. but in the past there was a well and and it sort of like the water went up all the time but but it was suitable at the time because of this function of like getting people to 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 um submerge and and clean their clothes and okay and body. Bueno, dear. Vamos por acá. Okay. <laughs> so now we are uh, in the bunker, in the establishment, and the floors, well, the walls are painted white, uh, except in some instances, which we'll get to later because it's a bit more frivolous, but also interesting. Uh, and the floors have different patterns on them. Is it a very crucial function? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, the reason why they were different, uh, as the guy explained, was uh, to, to mark areas that were... Uh, open to like different um, parts of the army so like for example the soldiers were able to access a certain amount of like com communal spaces but then all the rooms were only accessible um, by generals and uh, you know the heads of the army and so on so by by having that pattern for example uh, if the light went off and if you if you um if you had a match, you know, if you um, struck a match, you could see the floor and, 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 and kind of like know which way you were going and if you were going towards the right uh, rooms or not. Okay, because you could get court-martialed or something, no? For walking in on the general. Yeah, of course, well. Take it off his socks. <laughs> they have like uh, very strict rules, of course, like in the army. So so that that was a way of, of, of identifying the rooms. This was all done in like case of emergency, but then, as we learn later on, it was never actually used um, with that purpose. Um, yeah, and did he explain as well why it was so uh, little use? Because it was because Franco's forces came so quickly that that they didn't have time to actually set up properly in there. Um. Well, I think it was never. In, in, in fact, he said that because there's a palace right next to it, that, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the state uh, was basically based in that palace and, and there was no need at any point to, to, for all of them to, to hide. And they actually used it for um, just the normal, the ordinary population to, to, be, um, to be hidden there while the bombs were going off. But but never for I mean it was never because it, it was a bunker that was designed to basically for the state for the head of state and all the government to to go in there should there be like massive attack against them or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it, it I think it was a mixture of uh, most of the the battles developing on the other side of Madrid, the other end where we talked about. Uh, all the times, and we talk about it in the in the app, in the audio guides. Um, so yeah, the, the battles kind of like took place more in different areas, and and in the end, it wasn't really needed. Okay, um, and also other rooms that we saw in there. Um, 
can you tell us anything more about the other the distribution of the of the bunker? What the other? So we have the water area where to this decontaminate, disinfect people coming in, perhaps victims of gas attacks. Uh, but there are a lot of rooms in there. Uh, what are some of the other functions or capabilities of this space? There was another room uh, opposite the one where um, people would have cleaned themselves. Um, that had well, there was a kind of a toilet, and then there was another room that uh, would have been like the doctor's office, and and that was meant to be for any emergency operations, um, and so on. And well, it was all tiled so that it was easier to to clean, as is normal in in a hospital uh, environments. Um, and then at the end there was uh, like some dependencies that were supposed to be for kind of like kitchens, but they were never really used. And you call it bedrooms as well. And a warehouse. And a warehouse as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous structure. Uh, you mentioned before going down, if you feel overwhelmed or claustrophobic, you know, tell them and you can come back up or whatever. But it's a very unique space to be in, no? Um, it's, it has a sense of history. It, it's It's not... A, common place you would be in. I mean, the closest you come to it, we're actually going to a real bunker is like some kind of escape room or something where you're going <laughs> to try to escape this kind of yeah, thing, you know? So, um, and it's also very difficult to get in there. You have to book, we booked, I think, back in... Yeah, it must have been about March or something. Uh, yeah. I so, when I got the ticket. so a few months ago. So it is uh, something that sells out very fast as well if you are in Madrid. Now, you know, there are other things connected to this bunker. So like, obviously, you know, we discover as well through questions of the other attendees that the the exit the emergency exit went out of the park and out to the street uh these different things like that also had some kind of extra curricular uh things connected to it such as the movie business yes uh but before we get to that as well one of the revealing things obviously the tour guide especially in a place like this has to be quite neutral because it is such a uh, a, a controversial thing. I mean, even today in the especially newspaper, now. especially now, yeah, because yeah. there there's a huge debate going on about whether Franco should be uh, exhumed from Valle de las Caídas, where we were close to on Thursday. Uh, his family were humming and hawing, said they didn't want to take him, but now they've, they said they will take him. So, but anyway, it's, it's a touchy subject, obviously, but he did make a very revealing comment <laughs> about uh, other European nations uh, around this time. Um, yes, it was when he was asked about, because obviously, I mean, it's very difficult because he cannot give a lot of information about the civil war while you're there because it's only 30 minutes. And if you don't have a background on what was going on at the time, when he's talking about dates and, and he's talking about attitudes, it's very difficult for you to understand. Yeah, but, I, yeah, sorry. Um. So, but then when... When he was asked, kind of like to expand on uh, what was happening at a certain time, then is when he was talking about the, uh, what's called the appeasement? Uh, appeasement, uh, yeah. And from like Great Britain, and he was saying it should be called like, call this uh, slash uh, collaboration. Yeah, which also would apply to France as well. Uh, I have some sympathy. Uh, in certain regards because uh, they were so wrecked uh, financially after the war the first world war they was they just didn't want to commit the resources but overall I would agree that uh, the negligence from from the major European Western European nations like Britain and France uh, obviously their inaction led to uh, great gains for the great dictators of, of the other sides of Europe no and Central Europe as well obviously Nazi Germany um, well, we've discussed this before as well. I mean, I think if you talk to somebody who's a Brexiter, for example, Winston Churchill or someone like him, and and Britain in the war were always golden and pure, but as uh, many decisions taken before, during, and even after the war were very morally uh, dubious. Uh, as an aside, we'll talk about Ireland for a second. Uh, <laughs> as an aside. As an aside. Oh, well, the fact is, if D-Day had failed, it was going to be blamed on Ireland. Uh, there was, it was a deal between Churchill and um, FDR uh, that if it failed, they would say, oh, it's because uh, the plans were leaked from Ireland, and that's how the Germans got uh, advance warning of it. And um, that's why it was successfully stopped. Well, in that alternate version, obviously, it was a success, which would have been impossible anyway because Ireland had a very good collaborative um, stance during the war. Uh, it was very helpful towards the Allies uh, in more ways than one. And also, one thing that they, they conceded was that all tenor communications going from Ireland would have to go through a British cable, including the German embassy. Uh, so it would be impossible 
for that news to come out of Ireland. Um, another thing as well that was very interesting, I was reading the newspaper over the summer holidays, uh, was that Churchill uh, basically, like, he didn't need the, the bases, because, like, as part of the, before we became a republic in the late 40s, uh, Britain still had some access to naval bases around the south of the Republic of Ireland. Now, as the war progressed, he didn't actually need those bases, but he decided to kind of press us, so we would say no. So he could turn to the Americans and say, look, the Irish aren't going to help us. And his advisors were even telling him, like, don't do it, there's no point. You know, they're helping us anyway. And, uh, you know, it has no strategic purpose, but he wanted to do it anyway, just to score some kind of cheap political points. Uh, like kind of with the American audience as well like look at Ireland not helping us with the Second World War which is obviously complete bobbins um, as well now going back to the bunker of course that's what we're talking about Uh, it is interesting this dimension because of course in this time you have people from you know Britain and Ireland and other countries Americans as well fighting in international brigades so you know in contrast to the official government stances another aside as well before we go back to the bunker uh, Laurie Lee who we mentioned before as well I've started reading his book about the Spanish Civil War uh, which is very interesting as well because w- some of the things he like there's two things in the book that are interesting as a kind of continual thing one is that he was interviewed a lot by the Russians and each time it happens it becomes a bit more serious and he does mention as well in the bunker kind of the divisions between uh, the different bands the different groups of the Republican side uh, which war can you tell me um, well he just talks about because obviously we have like what was called the national side which uh, was uh, Franco's troops and then the side the Republican um, the Republican side um, which of course comprised not just the Republicans but also the communist anarchists and so on yeah um, and then what he talks about is that actually within the Republican side uh, there was some fighting because some people wanted to continue the war and some people wanted just to to stop hostilities. Yeah, well, let's think because you get a sense of these of this wider picture uh, from the tour, and obviously, as you said, because of time limits, you can't go into it. But it is very interesting if you do have a bit of a background, even and just kind of awake other questions um, uh, on the Civil War. Going back to Laurie Lee as well, he has a few instances where he meets a, a girl, well, he meets a woman uh, from Madrid, and they kind of spend a night in each other's arms, and she's like in hysterical shrieking. Uh, kind of like talking and talking about these horrors, but he doesn't speak Spanish. He doesn't know what she's talking about, and of course they, they uh, kind of take it to the physical level, I guess. But then he actually meets her again later on in the story, and uh, again he doesn't really understand her. But they kind of take comfort in each other, uh, in each other's arms, and they just talk to each other in two different languages, and they don't know what each the other person's saying. But but they're kind of like a refuge in the storm that is this kind of chaos, this this, this very big civil war. Um, now, also, as well, uh, this is the last part, I guess, we can talk about the bunker, which would be the movie aspect of it. Uh, so, I don't know, were you surprised? Were you impressed? That was kind of interesting. <laughs> no, I wasn't surprised, but it's just like this, uh, I don't know, like, there are so many things about, like, the 60s and 70s in Spain that I, I find very, I don't know, It was. I think it was an extremely weird world, you know, because, like, Things have been so so restricted and, and, and so Spartan during the 40s and the 50s, you know. And suddenly the 60s is this mixture of slight, like, opening to the world. and, and But there's this whole, like, kind of, like, big culture of... Um, terrible movies. Yeah, terrible movies and, and terrible many things, you know. Uh, cultural, <laughs> in quotes, uh, production. Um, and yes, and this place was precisely also used for these kind of uh, movies, uh, B movies, you know, Dracula movies as well. Uh, horror, semi horror, and I don't know what else. Um, they painted wall blacks black uh, yeah. for for one particular vampire, Dracula. <laughs> and the, the guy said it's very cutre, very like crap, obviously. Yeah, but also you said like, well, obviously you can imagine this would be a great place for a crypt or be a great place for to represent this kind of uh, vampire uh, Well, because also dwelling. there's a palace outside and then he's saying, well, it's an easy kind of like uh, place to location if you want to to film what's going on in the palace and then some people that are put into dungeons and stuff like that. <laughs> then it's quite handy because you get kind of like both things. Uh, and also he also mentioned Dr. Shivago. He did, yeah. So he they filmed some scenes in there. They did, yeah. Uh, they filmed quite a few things in Spain and and, and 
and quite a few things in Madrid specifically for for Dr. Zibau and 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 yes, the, the bunker was one of them. One of them. So we should actually revisit the movie and see because I keep hearing all these locations that were in it, and it would be quite interesting to. Um, would you allow me to recommend you an early Penelope Cruz movie? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> That's the bunker feature in it as well. Uh, no, but uh, you get to see like. Uh, but it's tacky. It, uh, it's kind of it's half tacky. Yeah, love those strange things that are hard is the international translation. Mm. So you can see one Chloe, a La Latina. Um, in the nineties, which, which is kind of cool. La Latina looks a bit different. Well, you don't really see La Latina. You see like uh, Plaza de Sabata, which is like the huge yeah. pit there. Um, so those look quite different. I don't think they. I think they painted it in the last like twenty years. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention before uh, we kind of go on to other things is that uh, going back to the archaeological museum, from the <laughs> first part, I forgot to say. I mean, they mentioned also the civil war in the in the museum and you haven't seen this video and I would recommend it and I know you will because you you sound very excited about it uh, it kind of documents uh, attempts by the museum to protect the cultural artifacts during the civil war so you see like archival footage of them going into the museum without electric light just with torches creates a very interesting dramatic uh, feel and mood and kind of putting them in the crates and boxes and uh, and then the the truck journey of taking them to Barcelona and Valencia mm-hmm. and even some ended up in Vienna in Austria as well and you can see like an interesting camera angle where they're like, in the car and there's cameras behind and you can see them just driving on the road and everything so it's actually quite cinematic in a way mm-hmm. uh, fortunately the majority of the things that they preserved uh, were safe after the Civil War and were brought back into Madrid some were lost and, and even today uh, nobody knows where some of the contents are but it was quite a striking um, video very interesting as well mm-hmm. So that's all for part two. Uh, Thank you very much for listening and we'll be joining you momentarily for the third part. Welcome back to part three. So, Mary, how would you evaluate the performance of today's tour guide? I think it was quite good, but he should have spoken slower. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I liked his direction. As soon as he finished facts and explained things, it was like, all right, let's move. <laughs> We're moving over here now. Next group. <laughs> uh, okay, so, well, that's it then. Um, that's only like 30 seconds of the part three, though, so we've got to stretch it out to make it a bit more decent. So, can you do the whole Radio Public uh, little plug again? Yes, Radio Public. Well, you can listen to our podcast on many platforms, but Radio Public is the best one to listen. <laughs> Only because we get the odd cent of a dollar when you listen. Well, we woke up to the good news today, separately, uh, that we made 20 cents um, from the app. True paid listeners? Yes, I think we thought that we have something like one dollar something since. But no, um, all right, Jockey, it is obviously higher than that. But yeah. uh, no, but um, no. I mean, it, it's quite steady, to be honest. Like we're getting um, we're getting listens every week, and then you know we're getting well, we we sort of like a bonus for people that uh, start listening uh, to several episodes um, in a row, and that's actually happening a lot now. Oh, really? Yeah? That's great. And I'm pretty sure it's not my mother because her phone's broken. <laughs> yeah, so, I had my so suspicions yes. it might be my sister, but no, I no, think... Uh, we're actually good yeah. this time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny to see, uh, you know, to see uh, the analytics because some people start by uh, listening to the the last the latest episode and then they just go on to listen to, like, really old episodes so that's quite nice well I, we need to solve a mystery because one perpetually popular episode is a uh, Christmas special yeah <laughs> I know that's like really bizarre and then recently El Arpa on the Beach was uh, is quite popular as well yeah. so I suppose that's kind of like a summer theme yeah. but yeah the Christmas one is popular all year round and then Bohemian Rhapsody you know which we we should actually re-record and do it because that was one of a, it was the first one it was the very think. first one 
Uh, so I think it was actually really short and, you know. Really bad quality. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know. I was suspicion, right? Uh, that, like, the Chinese town where they make all those Christmas decorations all over, like, throughout the year. Yeah. Are probably, like. Trying to push the. Uh, uh, no, they're probably, like, piping that into their workers in their factories. Ah, and well, yeah. Pencil and Christmas trees. For, um, for, yeah, for motivation. To give them the, the animal and the gas of the Navidadis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they can put an extra bit of sparkle into that. Uh,. I always had tinsel on the Christmas tree. I don't know what other Christmas decorations there. Into Bobbles? that. Baubles. Yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Have a Happy New Year. Well, maybe it's halfway through Christmas. No, or it, no, it must be like over halfway. Uh, well, I've already seen the first Halloween uh, decorations be placed into the shop. So, I'm sure the Christmas really? ones uh, can't be too much longer uh, so yeah actually even a supermarket in the UK uh, I've started selling some Christmas decorations it, you know what it's interesting I've been looking at their analytics apparently there's a, there's a huge surge in, in Christmas spending in that shop in December but right now they're having a bit of a low <laughs> well I couldn't have told you that they're not, they're not moving much stock <laughs> uh, it's a puzzler um, alright then well that's the end of this second episode of season 6 uh, we've already lied to you like last week we said the part three would be a rap song at the end of every podcast it's but uh, you know what um, after being in Capriccio Park we feel more closer to nature rather than close to the urban beats of hip hop and R&B and all that so take it away Mary say goodbye <laughs> bye peace <laughs> the Alapa podcast the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk.